thank you so much. This is a new day, and that is one of the best things about it. Um, another great thing is that I actually have my voice back. When I woke up this morning, I didn't have a voice at all. I, I did what most ministers do on vacation, which is get back Saturday night, Saturday night late, just in time to be here Sunday morning. So I made it, and the magic of the pulpit is working right now, which is that I am always healthy when I'm up here. That's why I like being up here so much. Um, and this is one of our traditions, is that every so often we do just a question and answer session. Now, if you are in the room and you have a question, Jackson will be bringing you a microphone. And we would like, unless you tell us not to, we will be turning the, um, the camera on you so that it's not just some disembodied voice talking to me and now people think I'm, I'm hearing voices. I do, I hear my own voice right now. Um, if you are online, you can put the question into the chat section of either Facebook or YouTube, which, whichever way you're doing it, and Clay will read them to us, um, and we'll just give him the mic so that that makes it onto the recording as well. So, my challenge to you, ladies and gentlemen, is to make Jackson run from over here to over there, and if you're in Timbuk1 online, then that counts. Um, what if you were raised a, in a religious tradition, perhaps whatever, whatever question it was that got you thrown out of Sunday school or your version of Sunday school, I challenge you to ask that now. I may not have the answer, but it'll be fun to hear the question. So does anyone have a question to start with, either in person or online? Kira. President, Madam President. And I'm going to ask you to stand up and maybe face the camera since you're so far up front. Reverend Kathleen, I know that there are many inspirational um, and devotional things that come out of the Home Office, but I would wonder what you consider your primary sources of inspiration for your talks. Oh, yeah. You know, I spent the week in Pennsylvania with a practitioner by the name of Eugene Holden. And he and I were talking about how we are pretty much giving up thinking that we're writing the talks. That we will do our research, that we get, every year we get, you know, a list of topics and it gets broken down by month and then it gets broken down by talk title. And I'll use the talk title. And I'll write a talk based on the talk title. Sometimes they'll give me quotations. Um, and I am in, steeped enough in Ernest Holmes that sometimes the quotations will just be obvious to me. Um, and then on Sunday morning, it generally goes like this. Okay, God, boss, I have a talk that I've written, and now I need you to finish it. And by you, I don't mean something outside of myself. I'm talking to the God within me. One of the most powerful tools I have learned, and I'm grateful you, you reminded me of this, is visioning. And it takes on a lot of different types of going within and hearing that, what some people would call the still small voice, and giving myself permission to follow it. My version of opening up and listening carefully to that which God, as me, has decided it wants to experience in this moment I find that I might follow some of my talk. I mean, you might notice that I don't really look at the, the script all that often unless I'm quoting somebody and I wish to be respectful and quote them correctly. Or I have numbers and I'm just, I'm not a numbers person. Um, the, the inspiration at this point really comes from that, that voice within. And I find that over the course of the week, people will say something to me and I know it's God speaking to me. So for instance, as I listened to Eugene, one of the things he talked about was being part of Agape International Spiritual Center in its early days, in its very early days. Um, some of you might know Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith because he was part of The Secret and he is one of the people that Oprah Winfrey goes to for spiritual advice from what I've heard. He has a 10,000 person center it's huge. 
And what I, what I heard very clearly was he was very clear in telling people every single week, come here and learn tools. Come on Sunday and really get the message. The message is this. Get out of here and go use those tools. I can teach everybody in front of me, but you can teach everybody that you are in front of every week. If you really want to go deep, take classes. If you really want your consciousness and therefore your life to improve, even if you think it can't get any better, that's a great dare for God. You want to see her show off? Tell her, I just think it's as good as it can get, and off we'll go. So my inspiration comes to me throughout the, wor the week, and it's always spirit speaking to me about what it is I need to learn. Um, right now, my green and growing edge is how do we become a 21st century post-COVID center in a way that serves the people online and People online, if you think you're not really part of this, yes, you are. If you're still listening at this point, yes, you are. This is part of your spiritual home. And I challenge you to find a way to be part of this group that is so much bigger than we think it is. So uh, there's that. I also, um, I love sociology, so I like looking for patterns and in history and in how society is working. And Ernest Holmes wrote a lot of books. And frankly, most of them are better than the textbook. Um, I'm reading, right now I am reading a book called A New Design for Living, which is the last that was published by Holmes during his lifetime. And it's, you know, if you think of the, the textbook as his first stab at it, this was his last bite at the apple. And so it's, it's very different, and I love it. Thank you for the question. Who else do we have? Do we want to go online? Do we have anything online yet? Okay. Okay, so Gina has a question. And so we're going to... Whoops. I want to know if there's some way you've thought about how you could bring more children in here to experience this philosophy at a young age, something we weren't blessed to have been able to do. And I think how wonderful it would be to get more kids in here to, to experience the joy that they have back there. Okay. I wondered about that, how we could do that. Uh, thank you. So there's three parts to that answer. One, there is no minister who has not thought about that, usually at 3 a.m thinking about how do we get kids in here, how do we serve, what do we do, that is part of our marketing thing. Um, and that's all at the physical level. So what, what in religious science we would call the level of effect. And what I know is that um, part two is I'm not allowed to go grab kids because I don't have any of my own, I can't drag them. I could bring my cats, but believe me, they won't listen to me here any more than they do at home. Um, I can't bring kids here. You can. It is not, believe it or not, it's not the minister's job to grow the church. Who'd have thunk it, huh? Do you have, are you served by this stuff? Am I serving you by what I say on Sunday? Who have you told? Is there anybody in your life that you love, but you're a little bit, about telling them about this stuff. I was like that with my mom. Of course, getting her here pretty much required her to have dementia, so she didn't know where we were taking her. But, <laughs> but we did it. We did it. Do you, yes, I said that. Um, there's a lot of people that I would love to see here. But what I'm noticing is my whole life is in this building. Everybody I know, all of my friends are already congregants. And so my job is to go out and get a different life. Go out and do things that are not part of this congregation so that I can influence people and let them know that there is another way of living. And I do that not by telling them necessarily 
but by being happy in public, by being successful and joy-filled in public, by using this stuff and telling people what I'm doing. And I am one person who can do that. But you guys, I mean, just in this room, we have 30 people. I don't know how many people are online right now or who will listen to it later. But I challenge you to not only use these tools and prove to yourself that they work, but to then go out and, and do a type of proselytizing that is simply, you know, this is what's working for me and this is what I'm doing. Use it, don't use it, it's entirely up to you. But if you are taking the time to log on or come here on Saturday, if you come here on Saturday, you'll have a lovely, quiet meditation. If you come here on Sunday, there's a great service that goes on. If you are taking the energy and time to do that, do it again on Monday and take those tools out into the world and let's actually do something with it. Faith without works is dead, guys. And so my thing about how do we bring children in, the last part is why do we want children here? That's a big part of it. Often... Often, and, and I will speak for myself, I find that I want these seats filled to prove that I'm doing something worth doing. I want to see the numbers up online or I want emails from people saying that was wonderful because my ego thinks I need it, thinks I am here for me. If you want children or young people here because the chairs are heavy and you don't want to be the person schlepping them around again, when we could have some young thing moving them for us, there's a great reason not to come to church for young people, to not be used. If we bring in individual kids because we think they'll have fun here, because we know that this works for us and they have expressed an interest in having their lives be improved, that's a great reason to bring kids in here. But I specifically need to be very careful about why I bring people here and why I ask others to bring people here. And if it's for my ego's sake, I need to, sit, I need to go back to my prayer chair and work on that and get really clean and clear that what we have here does not need to be sold. I don't need to sell this stuff. It works. I just need to admit I know what it is and be willing to talk about it. And people will bring their kids here Actually, usually what happens is adults bring their, come here because they want their kids to have some kind of spiritual practice. And two or three months in, it's the kid going, Mom, get up. We have to go to church. I'm ready to, what do you mean we're not going to church? Yes, we are. We have to go. I told my friends I'd be here. So yes, I, believe me, Gina, I have thought about it. Thought about it. Thought about it. We have a question over here, and then I want to make sure that we have time for anyone online. And I'm going to ask you to wait for the microphone. Good morning. Morning. <clears throat> We've had an interesting 14 months or so. You think? For a while. And, um, and it's, it's so great to look around and see how, with care, we are coming out of it. And we have a saying around here, only good can come from this. And what I wonder if you'd been thinking about and are willing to discuss for a minute are some specific goods, quote unquote, that you are seeing come out of all of this. Absolutely. So on the outer side, we have people like Dan Vega who don't have to drive over the mountain in order to sing for us. We have people like Tracy Brown who, or other people who can do talks for us without us having to figure out a way to move them across the country. That means we're not using the gas, and so we're not hurting the environment. It means that we get a much bigger pool from which to pull talent. One of our greatest resources in this center is that we have massive talent in the room and in town already, and there's even more out there. Um, I had been, I had known for a long time before 2020 hit that if we didn't get online, we were dead. If we don't get this tech stuff figured out and do something good online for the people out there who don't live anywhere near a center, 
Where I was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania this past week, the nearest center is about an hour away. Now, Mel's not impressed by that because he drives an hour and 15 minutes each way. But in large swaths of this country and every other country, there are places where this is not happening. And so to be able to be online and be serving people, sorry, who are wise enough to do it online so that they can have a second cup of coffee and put their feet up and not worry about what their jammies look like. Yes, I see you, bedhead. Um, that, that, all of that is what we call a COVID bonus. For me personally, I enjoyed 2020 because as an introvert, it was time for me to stop and go within. It is incredibly important to find time to sit in the silence, and our culture doesn't normally support that. Um, one of the things I've experienced as a minister, and I know a lot of people experience in their own work, is that if I cannot be seen doing something, if my car isn't here when you drive by, you have no way of knowing if I'm working. And 90% of my job I will never tell anyone about because it happens in silence in my prayer chair or one-on-one -on -one in a session that I will also not telling, be telling you about. It happens when I am working with another minister to help expand the consciousness of someone who is new to their job or, or we're just talking and that conversation is a soul conversation that's happening. 90% of what I do, you will never know about if I am doing my job correctly. A lot of it's confidential, and a lot of it just doesn't fit into words. To have a period of time in which I could not go anywhere else, I could not serve in a way that was visible, forced me to go in my heart and look at what is my ministry really about? What is it that is mine to do? Because if I am inspired by doing what I do, then I can't help but inspire you guys, and that's part of my job. But if I run dry because I'm busy saying, well, I'm supposed to be at the center by 10 o'clock because that's, that's when the meeting is, and I'm really actually would have been better served to be at the center at noon maybe because there was a great meditation happening in my heart, it, it's an interesting juxtaposition, but I find that I have learned that only good can come of whatever it is that's going on. And so I enjoyed my week in Pennsylvania. I enjoyed coming home last night. I enjoyed being here before I left. I enjoy all of it because all of it is for me. And some of what happened was I got sat on, I mean, we had COVID and then I broke my foot. Then I really couldn't move. God was not kidding. She wanted me to plant my butt and get quiet. And that is when I rediscovered visioning and learned how to do it right. Thank you for the question. Okay, you people online are totally getting shouted down. You've got to learn to type. Ms. Laura, welcome back. Okay. All right. Um, it's so good to be here. Um, so my question is a follow-up on Mel's, is that I had gone about a year without any physical touch to anyone, um, and just the being able to hug again. And then this is the first time in well over a year that I've sang. And, oh, the joy of just these simple little pleasures. Mm -hmm. How do we carry that through after we're able to do all the other stuff? You know, just that, that pure joy of, like, wow, singing, how wonderful. Sorry, coding for my throat so that I can sing. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, to be honest. How do we... Keep that joy in the little things. Keep the joy in the little things. Okay, so I used to live in Vermont, and when I had a deal with a friend that we would never not notice, we would keep reminding each other 
of how many shades of green there are. Of just how beautiful that's, you know, like when you live someplace for a long time, it sto you stop seeing it? When you are in relationship with someone, if, if you're not careful, you will stop seeing their amazingness. It is a spiritual practice to look at whatever is in front of you and find the beauty. And you're an artist, Laura, you know this. Seeing that quality of God that we know as beauty in everything and not forgetting. You know, I used to have bronchitis nine months out of the year. And I had asthma. For me, the ability to breathe is not something I take for granted. Sometimes you have to be a little silly with it. When my mother was visiting me in California and I had one of my first cars that were all one color, I hopped and I pulled her into the car and I said, watch this mom, you're gonna be so excited. And I turned on the car and then I turned off the car and I looked at her and I turned on the car and I turned off the car and she's like, what? I mean, she's known me long enough to know it was some weird thing. And I said, it does it every time. <laughs> being grateful doesn't, being spiritual doesn't have to be so flippin' serious. Yes? yes? My religion is one of happiness and joy, Ernest Holmes. If you are not having fun in your spirituality, if you don't have that sense of aliveness and inspiredness, if, there's not a, if God doesn't giggle with you, y'all need to fire your God and get a new one. A better one. The 12 steppers have that right. You need to hire a God you can do business with. Because if God don't think stuff's funny. No, honey, you don't think stuff fu is funny and God thinks you are. There's just so much joy in life. And if we cut off that joy, what we're doing is cutting off life itself. Now, that does not mean life doesn't get serious. 2020 was very serious and not at all fun for a lot of people. But if life is bringing the serious, if we are manifesting suffering without trying to, why should we try to? Obviously, we're really good at doing it without trying to. And so I would suggest that when you go out into the world and let life be big in you and loving and good and let God, what is the life that, you, that God wants to live as you? This morning in, in meditation, I got, if I was on a date with God today, would I purposely try and be boring and serious? Because I guarantee you there would not be a second date, pun intended. <laughs> what if we could show God a really good time and that was our highest spiritual practice sorry I am aware that my, my microphone is having issues um, and we are actually out of time but I want to give one last chance for our bedheaded friends run Jackson run all right, Kelly Sibley would like to know how far flung your congregation is. Well, I don't generally fling people. I will not fondle the flock. I will not fleece the flock. I will not fling the flock. We have a new section for my, that's how we got taught ethics. I will not fondle the flock. I will not fleece the flock. If you remember that, you're fine. Sometimes other words were used, but we won't go there. Um, I am aware of my sister throwing me a softball. She is in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I would ask that if you are, obviously, everybody in this room, I think the furthest away came from Sedona today. Our musician was in Sedona today. Uh, actually, no, because Laura now lives in San Diego, but she drove in. The people who are furthest away are probably online. So I would ask, especially if you're new, that you uh, tell us where you are right now online. I can't reach you and I can't send you to hell, so I'm just asking. We, we canceled hell in this particular faith tradition. Do we have responses coming in? 
They are from far, so far away, it's taking a while for it to hit the, the internet. It has to go all the way to the moon and then back. All right. So maybe we'll get some by the end of uh, service. Please don't think that you've, you've missed your chance because I can't come hunt you down, but I will try. Um, so I'm going to go to prayer because that's what we do here. That is the more serious part of what I do or at least it looks like it from the outside. But when I pray, and what I want for you as, you, as I pray, is that that sense of aliveness, excuse me, rises up in you. That sense of joy. That's, it, it might feel to you like a sense of peace or just being loved. There's no just about that, I suppose. A sense of good. And so I have the honor and privilege of being the one in prayer today and calling in our good, calling in in form that which is already true of us in spirit. And so if it helps you to close your eyes, go for it. I come here so that we all remember that we, any one of us, could be doing this prayer. It happens to be me today. And that which is the truth in each and every one of us is God. It is the spirit. It is life itself at its most joyous, its most vital it's most exuberant and it is that light that life that love that is here and now expressing itself as me and so i speak my word for everyone here to remember that that light that love is here as us that all of those questions have answers and we get to explore those answers with no nothing being made wrong the divine within us is our rightness. It is our righteousness. We get right with the divine within us. We learn how to love it. We learn how to see it. We learn how to listen with our inner ear and see with our physical eyes closed. We allow that divine being to rise up in each and every one of us. And that is the truth of our magnificent souls. We are having a spiritual awakening here together this morning and everyone within reach of my voice. No matter where you ha are far flung to, all of us are the divine in form looking to have a party this week, looking to live large this week, li looking to be exuberant and allow ourselves to rise up in this holy, holy ex uprising we have planned and allow everything that doesn't look like that fully aliveness to simply fall away all of that energy that took on form as our suffering is now being returned into its purest form which is pure energy and recycled into something worthy of having worthy of being worthy of doing and so in this moment i call upon life itself to live us in a joyful way, to live each and every one of us as the question and the answer. The infinite good is now in form as each and every one of us, and it is living life. It is loving life. It is reveling in the fullness of life. And so I am grateful for that, that this is what it does, and it cannot be stopped. There is a healing happening right now. The true meaning of salvation is healing. And any old idea that is ready to be healed, that says we have to be serious and not have fun, all of that is now healed right here and now. And that is spirit at work. And so I am grateful I let it be, and so it is. Joy, why? 
wash over us. We let, we let it be. We let the grace wash over us. We let. over us we let well we let it be we let the joy wash over us we let we let it be we let the grace wash over us. We let, we let it be. Mm, thank you. You may be seated. Wonderful. So just as we took that song into our bodies, I ask you to remember that your spirituality, your godness does not stop at your checkbook. It is every aspect of your life. It's what you eat. It's what you drink. It's what you do with your money. It's what you do with the space in your home. It is who you hang out with after service. And so I ask you to consider that if this is truly serving you, support it. Tell spirit you want more of this energy in your life. And we do that consciously and wisely. So if your gift, your financial gift is something you're, that is in your hand right now, I ask you to hold it over your heart. 